Um, the latest estimate, I mean, the, the figures are all over the place, but the latest estimate from the, the International Labour Organization in 2012 um, is that there are that there is a likely total, a total of 20.9 million people working in conditions of forced labour across the world. The ILO itself concedes that that's a very conservative estimate, and we could get into all sorts of questions about definitions that unfortunately there isn't the time um, to engage with, um, but nevertheless the ILO uses a very restrictive um, definition of forced labour, which leads, um, I think, to a particularly low um, figure. Um, as I said, that's a debate that unfortunately we can't get into. Um, but what I think is more interesting is the profile um, of the problem that the ILO's figures give us an insight into. Um, it indicates that of the 20.9 million, um, that, that it's, 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 its figures, um, uh, that, that it estimates, um, fully 90% of those people are exploited in the private economy by individuals um, or enterprises. And of those, 22% are victims of forced sexual exploitation and 68% are victims of forced labor exploitation. So in short, problems of forced labor and trafficking for labor exploitation are overwhelmingly phenomena of economic exploitation in the private economy. And I think the more interesting thing perhaps for our purposes here is that um, the problem spans the breadth of the global economy, uh, the geographical breadth um, occurring in richer countries as well as poorer um, economies, um, but also occurring not only in um, non-market contexts or in uh, small-scale production for local markets, um, but in parts of economies that are, are um, deeply embedded in global production networks and global value chains. These are problems that are occurring in the mainstream excuse me, of global production um, and trade. And, and there's a, a growing body of empirical res research which, uh, which identifies the, the forms that they take in, in different areas. Um, so this point uh, poses a challenge. Um, the first is, is, is one um, for um, scholarship, for theory, for analysis, um, how to account um, for this um, state of affairs. Um, uh, um, the first part of my paper um, seeks to challenge um, a view um, that uh, in some way these problems exist outside um, capitalism, they exist outside the globalization of, of production, which, which remains a very um, common um, argument. Uh, and it gives rise to a set of assumptions that these problems are less likely to occur in parts of economies um, that are integrated into global production networks. They're less likely to occur in value chains that are coordinated by uh, big brands, big transnational um, corporations, um, simply because there is an assumption that transnational corporations uh, are able to to wield the kind of leverage over supplier firms, over contractor firms, which will uh, enable the elimination of these kinds of, of problems. The more that brands are concerned with brand image, the more likely they're going to be to try to influence uh, what's going on in their value chains to, to eliminate um, uh, these problems. And so there, there's a very widespread assumption, which uh, I've come across time and time again in um, uh, conversations with representatives of, of, of governments, of, of corporations, and so on. Um, the forced labor is much less likely to occur where large corporations and global brands are at the helm of supply chains and instead more likely to occur in small scale um, production, which is not integrated into global production um, and trade. Um, and the first part of the paper, I advance a perspective that, that challenges this, um, that aims to present a um, a, a kind of meso-level um, uh, perspective, uh, which tries to, to demonstrate how uh, the problem of forced labor in the global economy is intimately linked to the way that global value chains function. Um, uh, I think that's, I hope, <laughs> that's an interesting um, way of looking at these problems in as much um, as global value chains are now become uh, overwhelmingly the primary structures around which production, trade, and by extension, development are uh, organized in the contemporary period. Um, the um, United Nations Conference on Trade and Development, UNCTAD, has recently published its 2013 World Investment Report, uh, and it puts forward um, the very striking um, estimate that some 80% of total global trade is now accounted for by global value chains coordinated by transnational corporations, 80%. Um, I think, Raoul, you were talking a little bit about this yesterday as well. And so, um, uh, conversations go on about whether or not this is an overestimate. Um, even if it is a slight overestimate, it's still 
It's still an arresting figure. Um, if we accept as well um, what I think is the very persuasive observation that's been put forward by um, uh, Will Milberg and Deborah Winkler in a in a um, a very interesting recent book. If you haven't read it, I, I recommend it to you, called Outsourcing Economics. Um, as, the, as they put it, the goal of industrial upgrading within GVCs has become nearly synonymous with economic development itself. If we accept that proposition, then I think a focus on global value chains and seeking to understand how the problem of forced labour is connected with the functioning of global value chains uh, allows us to put these questions of labour exploitation very firmly in debates um, about the globalisation of production, trade and the, the forms that, that, um, that, that development is, um, is, is now um, taking. Um, unfortunately, I don't have time um, to, to, to go through the argument that I, I try to set out, um, so let me just make a couple of um, a very quick comments about it. Um, the first is that um, the pattern of production in global value chains, um, uh, or, the, or the pattern of production that, that, that is, the, is the driving rationale behind um, global value chains, essentially rests on the creation and the harnessing of massive global asymmetries of market power, of political power and of social conditions. Um, and again, um, uh, Will Milberg and, and Deborah Winkler have put forward, a, I, I think, one of the most interesting accounts in, uh, um, in recent times of, 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 of these kinds of, of dynamics. Um, creating those kinds of asymmetries um, rests on securing a structure um, in which firms at the top, at the helm of global value chains, occupy uh, oligopolistic positions, but competitive markets prevail among lower tier suppliers. Um, as a foundational element of firms' cost-cutting strategies in the interests of maintaining um, cost uh, markups. Um, so the idea is that you have oligopoly at one end um, of global value chains, competitive markets among lower tier um, suppliers at the other. Uh, and that enables uh, lead firms to transmit uh, massive commercial pressures along the length of the value chain, which suppliers and producers um, often seek to manage, particularly in labour-intensive and price-sensitive um, value chains through um, labour costs, through the mechanisms of labour costs. And I think the important point to make here is that forced labour doesn't emerge as some kind of aberration or, um, or some kind of rogue element um, in these kinds of production structures, um, but rather what um, Andy Crane has referred to as a, as a purposeful and coherent management strategy um, that there are a, a range of incentives within global value chains that push in the direction of this kind of management strategy, um, excuse me, as a means of remaining um, competitive. Um, the second point that I want to make um, is um, that we assume um, that the incentives within global value chains for suppliers to um, uh, uh, observe um, the strictures of social compliance will be high, uh, particularly where um, transnational corporations are able to to wield that kind of leverage um, that I uh, that I mentioned before. Uh, and a focus on global value chains and or particular kinds of global value chains reveals um, that that is quite simply not the case. Um, the incentives towards social compliance can be very very low and in some cases non-existent uh, in global value chains. And again, we come back to the idea that that um, forced labour can be a purposeful management strategy uh, within global value chains on the part of, of some, comply, uh, 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 um, uh, some um, value chain participants. Um, now, at the other end of the spectrum, um, the um, asymmetries of political power are evident in the relationships between business and governments. And this isn't simply the, in, in the normal sense that, that, we're, that we're accustomed to talking about these, these problems, where massive transnational corporations are able to wield enormous power over uh, governments in developing countries to negotiate for themselves exemptions from labour laws or from environmental laws and, and so on, um, but also governments in richer um, uh, countries and, and um, uh, some of the governance um, uh, strategies that I'm, I'm going to be looking at in, in just a second reveal um, that, 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 that this works across the board. It's not simply a, a problem for developing countries. And so we see in the UK, for instance, uh, an absolute reluctance um, to try to deal with these problems in a way that will involve taking on uh, the interests of big business and, and, and transnational um, corporations. Um, 
And the third point that I want to make is that, is that um, the conditions which drive in the direction of forced labour, the commercial conditions, the social conditions and the political conditions vary. They vary by geographical context, by social context, by the, structure, the, the, the type of value chain in question and the kind of structure that it, that it takes. And, and so we really need to understand uh, the where, why and the how of forced labour in particular kinds of value chains, in particular uh, contexts. And I hope that this kind of meso-level perspective enables us um, to do that. So the second part of my paper then um, seeks to look at um, a particular governance strategy that's lately become um, fashionable. Um, I, I start off by indicating that um, um, there has been a great reluctance um, to consider the uh, problem of forced labour um, with reference to economic factors on the part of international organisations, on the part of national policy makers, uh, on the part of, 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 of many actors that are, that are trying to deal with this. The ILO has a real problem with it. Um, the ILO, um, in, if, if, uh, if, you, if you look at its major statements on, on, on forced labour over recent years, the ILO is very, very equivocal about what the relationship might be, if any, between globalisation and capitalism and and um, the problem of forced labour, and seeks to attribute it uniformly to market failure, um, that this is some kind of aberration from a norm which can be achieved um, through greater regulation and a bit more um, monitoring. Um, elsewhere in the policy world, again, there's a real reluctance to see uh, these problems through an economic lens. Um, uh, most national governments, um, for instance, in, in Europe, um, prefer to deal with this problem as one of criminality. Uh, it's about disrupting criminal trafficking networks works, it's about seeking out rogue employers and enforcing labour law, and of course it's about border control, um, and very rarely has it been linked to the economy, um, to questions about how economies work, global um, or um, national. Until recently, and recently, um, as some of you may know, um, the state of California uh, put together um, what has been seen as quite an innovative strategy to try to deal with the uh, problem of forced labour in um, global supply chains, um, uh, which uh, um, has been, uh, w w which is called the, the Transparency in Supply Chains Act, and um, which has been in force since the beginning of last year. Um, and what is uh, the, 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 the California Act has been held up as some kind of example um, of a new kind of governance strategy that can be used in the global economy to try to deal with these worst problems of labor exploitation. It is, of course, significant um, that this uh, governance strategy has focused solely on problems of forced labor and trafficking, um, somehow ring fencing them and isolating them from, from other forms of, of, of labor exploitation, saying essentially that these kinds of exploitation are different um, and therefore you can deal with those without having to take on the big questions about labor exploitation in general in global um, production um, and trade. Um, and so it's been held up as a, as a success story. Um, the success uh, can mean very little other than that it was successfully passed as legislation because there simply hasn't been time um, to discern any, any tangible results. But it's also interesting, I think, and this is the point that I make in the paper, that it's not actually driving towards generating tangible results. There's no mechanism associated with this kind of legislation for measuring results. Uh, it is a mechanism solely that encourages companies to take the issue of um, forced labour and supply chains seriously and to report on what they're doing. Um, so the only requirement is that companies put a statement on their website about what they're doing to address forced labour in supply chains uh, relative to their own um, benchmarks, their own standards for securing appropriate labour conditions in their supply chains. So there's no external um, stipulation um, of what these standards need to look like or what companies need to be doing. They're simply asked to report to consumers about what it is um, that um, they're doing. Uh, and so I just want to make a couple of points about this, um, and, and obviously more detail is in the paper. Um, the first is that this is fully consistent with uh, and an attempt to reinforce um, the prevailing drift in contemporary neoliberal um, global economic governance, which is towards the primacy of private governance. Um, this ostensibly looks like the state becoming involved in some kind of new and innovative governance initiative, um, but it quite simply is not. It's reinforcing, and it aims to reinforce the primacy of prime, uh, private governance with a very limited role um, for the, uh, the state. The state simply puts in place this legislation, 
uh, there's no enforcement mechanism and there certainly isn't any kind of sanction uh, mechanism. Um, and so the, the, the contract is between firms and consumers based um, on a model um, of private um, governance, which simply can't work. Uh, we know um, that corporate social responsibility does not work on its own as a model for dealing with labour exploitation in global supply chains, and we know that it's even more ineffective when you're dealing with those hidden problems of forced labour and um, trafficking for, for labour exploitation uh, in that um, kind of context. Um, but the overarching difficulty with this kind of governance initiative is, of course, that it doesn't seek to address... Um, least completely untouched the underlying causes of these problems um, in global supply chains. It simply assumes um, that with a bit more auditing, firms are going to be able to root out the rogue firms, the delinquent suppliers, um, uh, push a model of social compliance further down the, the value chain, and everything will be absolutely fine. The roots of forced labour are assumed to lie outside the dynamics of value chains and that they can simply be uh, eradicated with a bit more um, auditing and a bit more monitoring um, here and there. So if what I say in the first part of the paper is accepted as persuasive, that these problems of forced labour are intimately linked with the ways in which the global economy is organised, the ways in which global value chains function, the contemporary forms that global production and trade take, then it follows that these kinds of governance initiatives simply aren't going to get to the root causes uh, of, of forced labour uh, in the global economy. What they will do is afford transnational corporations an additional aura of legitimacy. They'll be able to claim that they're taking steps to do something about this, uh, but to reinforce um, that drift towards private governance and the evacuation of the state um, from the functions of, of global economic governance for uh, in, in relation to labor standards thank you